Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College, a program that encourages good discussion in our community on today's local and global issues. Now, your host for Conversations from St. Norbert College, author, professor, and nationally known sports economist, Dr. Kevin Quinn. Welcome to Conversations from St. Norbert College. I'm Kevin Quinn. Our special guest is David Weggy, professor of political science at St. Norbert College and director of the St. Norbert College Survey Center. We will discuss the changes that the Survey Center is going through, including a name change. Weggy founded the Survey Center at St. Norbert in 1984. In that position, and as a private consultant, he has appeared on CNN and ABC New York, among other media. He often provides background information to reporters regarding politics and surveys. Weggy has been a member of the St. Norbert College faculty since 1979. David, welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm glad to be here, Kevin. Well, before we get to all the cool survey stuff, I want to ask you a little bit about your background. And tell us about where you grew up and how you got here. Well, how I got here. I, well, I grew up in a small town in northwestern Minnesota, Thief River Falls, Minnesota. A uh, town of about, uh, when I was there, about 6,000 people. It's, it's uh, grown to 8,000 now. Uh, but went to, uh, to school there, went uh, to a junior college uh, in Thief River for the first two years, and then I uh, transferred to uh, uh, University of Minnesota Duluth uh, and finished my bachelor's degree there. Uh, and then I spent four years in the Air Force, uh, and while I was in the Air Force, uh, got my master's degree and then went on to my Ph.D. at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee and taught for one year at UW Parkside uh, before coming to St. Norbert College in 1979. What did you do in the Air Force? I was an instructor in the health care sciences field. And so th there was a, uh, a program that all of the health professionals in the Air Force had to go through. Uh, and there was a four-week course, which was basically a high-level uh, emergency medical uh, course. And I taught that course. Uh, it was a four-week course. Oh wow! So if you have a heart attack, I can I know what to do. Okay, well that <laughs> that would be good. Let's 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 not test that today. <laughs> All right. So you went to uh, you know it must have been very different uh, going from Thief River Falls to First Duluth. That must have seemed like the big city. It, it did seem like the big city, uh, and coming to to Green Bay seems like uh, you know that that big city is as well. Although it, moving south, so the the weather is actually a little more. Uh, uh, warm here than it, it was in Thief River. It was uh, Thief River is about 50 miles uh, south of the Canadian border, and about 50 miles uh, east of the North Dakota border. So it's way in the northwest corner of the state. Very cold. Uh, yeah, I, I remember being in uh, Duluth once uh, many years ago, and the the wind just blows up one pant leg and down the other, <laughs> it and it seems to do that for about eight months of the year. <laughs> so uh, how did you wind up at Milwaukee? Why why Milwaukee? Well, that was uh, one of the schools I applied to, got accepted to, and then and they had money available for me <laughs> <laughs> as a as a graduate teaching assistant, and so that was the primary reason. So uh, you, you have your degree in political science. Sure. Um, was there that aha moment that you said, "Wow, I I want to be a political scientist"? How how did that happen? Well, I think uh, when I was in the Air Force, I was actually just taking courses kind of for something to do, and I wasn't really sure at that point. Uh, but my Air Force job, I would teach from 6 in the morning until noon. And my wife was a social worker. She worked until 5 in the afternoon. And so I had my afternoons totally free, and I had all this free time, wasn't sure what to do. I thought, well, I'll take a couple of grad seminars in political science. And as I started doing that, got hooked and, and really enjoyed the field, and then uh, received a lot of encouragement from the faculty there to go on and get my PhD. Do you remember the first survey you ever did? I do. It was a survey of district attorneys in Texas for my master's thesis. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? Well, it was, uh, I was uh, writing a paper on the impact of the Miller versus California uh, obscenity decision uh, that put uh, responsibility back on local communities to define what obscenity was. And so I wanted to find out how district attorneys were defining obscenity for their community. And it was actually, you know, this is back in 1974. Uh, I think it was probably one of the first uh, kind of empirical studies that the master's people had done. Uh, at, I was at Midwestern State University at that time. So what did you find? 
I'm just curious. What? How did Texas dis district attorneys in the Deep Throat era uh, determine obscenity? Well, there were some differences. I don't recall specifically what the differences were, but there were some differences between metropolitan areas and the more rural areas in, in Texas. So the metro areas were a little, uh, the large metro, you know, the Houstons, Dallas, and, and so forth, were a little more on the liberal side uh, at that point, and uh, some of the others were a little more conservative in terms of their definition. Oh, that's interesting. So then you went to UWM, and did you uh, live in the Brady Street area at, at all? Did, what was that like back in the 70s? Well, that was that was a, a great spot. We lived uh, just a few blocks. We didn't live right on Brady Street, but we lived a few blocks from the university and lived in a little uh, uh, upper flat above a tailor uh, shop and a, and a barber shop. Um, and uh, I could walk to campus and... and uh, Wow. We had a, one child, our daughter, Christy, at that point, and she was in a, a kind of a preschool program at the university, so it worked out real well. And, we, and, and UWM was a great spot for me because they, they had a, a relatively small Ph.D. program. We only had about 10 people in the Ph.D. program. And the uh, university at that time, the political science department, while it wasn't widely uh, known to those outside of political science, uh, among those within political science and, and based upon various ratings, it actually rated as a very high uh, program. And uh, I happened to work with a, a couple of uh, individuals who uh, were, uh, were very well known in their field and, and gave me a lot of guidance, which was, which was wonderful. And, and they, as a small department, really worked hard to make sure their grads uh, got jobs after, after they finished their PhD. And then you came to St. Norbert College? Well, then I went to Parkside for, for one year. Oh, right. Uh, and <clears throat> finished my dissertation while I was teaching at Parkside and then uh, came to St. Norbert College in the, the fall of 79. Well, if uh, folks uh, saw St. Norbert in 1979 and saw it now, they probably would not recognize the place. Probably not. I mean, there are several new buildings that we, that we have on campus. I mean, the campus has been transformed. It's, uh, uh, it was a, you know, a very nice campus at that time, but I think we uh, maybe only had about 1,400 students. So it's grown in terms of student population, and I think the facilities have become uh, ex extremely, extremely nice, and we've got great facilities to work with here. And I think we have the same number of parking spots that we did. Back in the <laughs> well, I, I, do, I do remember uh, I came when Neil Webb was the president, and I do remember at one of his annual uh, talks to the, to the uh, faculty that he said one of his proudest moments was paving the JMS parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, so it wasn't long after you got here that uh, you started the survey center. How no. did that happen? Well, um, uh, Neil Webb stepped down in, uh, I believe, 1983, uh, and a new president, Tom Mannion, came to campus in, in the summer of 1983. And uh, Tom was, was meeting with uh, small groups of faculty, having lunch with them to kind of get to know the faculty. And I remember one of the things he said at that luncheon was he thought that St. Norbert College was one of the best kept secrets in the Midwest. And if anyone had any ideas on how we could get the name of the college out to a broader uh, uh, community uh, that we should uh, let him know. And so I, I uh, made it a point to, to walk out of uh, that meeting with him and said, well, I've got an idea. Uh, let's start a survey center and let's start doing regular statewide surveys. I had actually done my first uh, survey, two surveys, uh, other than the, the district attorney surveys, uh, when I was at Parkside. And uh, the first survey I did in Parkside was, was a uh, pre-election survey uh, for the city, uh, and it was a mayoral race. And I uh, worked in conjunction with the Racine uh, newspaper editor. And uh, I was a bit naive about doing surveys at that point, and uh, some of my other colleagues at the, at the university had passed on this opportunity, and I, I raised my hand and said, well, I'll try that. And, and, uh, uh, it turned out that, that we uh, projected uh, the right winner and very close, and then uh, that editor of the newspaper and myself put together a statewide consortium uh, for the 1980 election uh, and uh, got three television stations and I think seven newspapers to buy into the consortium uh, to do a statewide survey for the 1980 presidential election. So. 
when I talked to Tom Mannion, I had had some experience with this already, uh, and uh, felt pretty confident that we could we could mount this kind of a, a research center here that would be ongoing, uh, and also to get some support, uh, financial support in particular from media outlets to uh, to help us with that. So what, what have been some of the more interesting projects over the years that you have had a chance to work on here? <clears throat> well, there's, there's been, uh, you know, every project is interesting in the <laughs> sense that it's, uh, many of them are, are unique and they're, and they're different. Certainly the, the statewide survey that we do, the Wisconsin survey, uh, now in conjunction with Wisconsin Public Radio, uh, is uh, you know, kind of our, our hallmark survey and, and that's always interesting to see where the public is in those. But um, I, a couple I might point to. One would be we, we did the uh, did the survey work for the Green Bay Packers when they were going to sell stock, and so had an opportunity to work with Bob Harlan and uh, to uh, what they wanted to know. They wanted us to make a projection. How much stock do you think we can sell? And uh, we came in with uh, we we did a national survey, uh, and we surveyed uh, you know a fan uh, database that they had as well as the general public. Uh, and we came in with a projection that was uh, uh, probably about five million dollars more than than they had anticipated. But we were we were very close, and on the basis of uh, some of that work, I think they made a decision that uh, it would be worthwhile going ahead with a with a stock sale. Um, uh, you know, some others. Well, the one one I'm working on right now is is particularly important and and interesting because we are doing a uh, quality of life study uh, in three different communities. Now, the survey center has always done a Brown County quality of life survey since 1995, but now uh, we were able to get the Brown County group and the Fox Cities group and a group in Oshkosh together. And so we're doing quality of life surveys regionally uh, and uh, working with the, the Chamber of Commerces and the community foundations and the United Ways in, in those communities to uh, create what we call the LIFE uh, Project, uh, surveying uh, leaders, community leaders, uh, community members, the citizens, and then we have a lot of secondary data that we're collecting. But I think you know, bringing this collaboration together has been challenging but it has been really rewarding too in seeing how all of these groups can work together uh, to improve the quality of life in, in this region. So what, I mean, what do you ask people? I mean, what makes for a good life? I mean, philosophers <laughs> have been wondering about this for a long time and you managed to get it in 20 questions, right? Oh well, no, it's, it's uh, probably more like 80 questions. 80 questions. <laughs> uh, well, we, we have a whole series of, of areas. We, we ask about uh, their work life, uh, about how they perceive uh, uh, the need in the community in terms of self-sufficiency. Uh, we ask about arts and culture, uh, leisure and uh, recreational activities, uh, health, uh, just a, a myriad of, of basic issues that communities need to, need to deal with. And we've, we've got a set of core questions that we ask across all leaders and those same questions across all of the citizens in the communities. So now what we can do is we can compare how leaders view things compared to the citizens in their community and then how leaders across these three communities of Brown County, Fox Cities, Oshkosh uh, perceive things and do the same uh, among citizens. So uh, the data is going to be very, very rich. And, and uh, you know, if you're into uh, data and statistical analysis, this, this is, a, you know, a dream world to, to be operating <laughs> in. So, so you said you've been doing this in Brown County since 1995. Right. Um, what's different now? And I'm imagining in some ways Brown County is a microcosm for the whole state. Mm -hmm. what, what's different about the quality of life now versus 15, 20 years ago? Well, I think, uh, I think we've seen improvements in uh, certainly in areas like arts and culture, uh, which uh, you know, at earlier times, uh, particularly in the 1980s, was, was uh, not a real strong uh, focus of the community. Uh, I think that's improved considerably. Um, I think some of the uh, basic uh, uh, economic conditions seems to be doing pretty pretty well. They're, they're pretty even, really, uh, in how people perceive the, their financial situation and their economic life. Um, I th there's some interesting differences in how people perceive 
uh, environment, the environment, for example, uh, especially like the Fox River and, and uh, the, the quality of the, of the water in the Fox River and so forth. And we've seen changes in, in that area as well. Well, one of the things that I, I as just a you know, citizen, I've noticed changing is that we seem to have a lot more public opinion polls reported. It, I, you know, if you turn on CNN or MSNBC or Fox News, they're always talking about a poll. Right. You know, when I was a kid growing up, the only poll I remember is the Gallup poll. <laughs> That's and, right. you know, Johnny Carson used to sort of make fun of it, you know, uh, but um, what's different in the world of polling than when you first got started? Is it just me or is it, is it really oh, a different place? It's a different place. Um, I mean, there has been uh, a tremendous expansion in the number of uh, polling organizations that exist. I mean, uh, we are one, uh, the Survey Center is one of about 265 polling organizations in, in the country. Um, and so I think part of the growth has been because of technology and because of uh, uh, individuals feeling that they're able to conduct polls uh, easier now than at, at, an, at a different time. Uh, and so the methodologies of, of sampling, there's sampling companies that are providing telephone samples, so they're, they're readily accessible. Um, you know, Gallup for many years was doing personal interviews. I mean, that would be very difficult for organizations to do unless you have a lot of resources. So the numbers have increased dramatically. At the same time, uh, one of my concerns is that uh, some of the methodologies are uh, not as strictly followed by some of these groups. And there is a sense, especially as we move to the online survey world, there's a, there's a sense that anyone can do a survey. Uh, and what, what they often don't think about is that, well, survey work is not just being able to contact you know, 400 people and, and, and ask them a couple of questions. I mean, there's a very uh, stringent uh, sampling methodology that has to be used, and there's uh, kind of a, a science of question wording and uh, analysis and so forth. Uh, I think for some organizations, uh, methodological standards have declined, and, and that's, that's a problem, that's an issue. I'm not so concerned about the numbers of polls. In fact, I, I think I'd rather have quite a few polls rather than simply uh, the, the gospel is according to, to Gallup. Right. <laughs> you know, so there's someone checking uh, the work of Gallup. Well, one of the things that I've noticed is if you go online, there are these amalgamators of it. And I think of polling report, mm -hmm. uh, real clear politics, and somebody who is my personal favorite is Nate Silver and. Sure. 538 and that sort of speaks to what you're saying is that okay one poll is just one poll but if you have 20 polls all point in the same direction and one poll that's saying something something completely differently that that can be the case one of the things I find a little bit disturbing about this is that uh, I think some of the polling organizations have become ideologically driven so you know I'll get a answering you know I'll pick up the phone and say, do you think, you know, Senator so-and-so is bad if he wants to go and club baby seals, yes or no? Right. And the next thing I know, Senator so-and-so is, you know, has a disapproval rating of such-and-so. Mm -hmm. is, is that as prevalent as I suspect it is, or? Uh, well, um, th there are a lot of interest groups out there that are either conducting their own polls or they're, they're contracting for others to, to conduct polls on their behalf. And uh, they do have an ideological position, and you can ask you know, the right questions, or you can focus on a particular aspect of an issue that leads one to, to think that's the most important aspect of that issue. Uh, and you can also design questions that will get the kinds of information you would like to, like to have. Um, and I, you know, I'm concerned about that as well, I, I would I have much more confidence in kind of the the nonpartisan, non-affiliated organizations that are conducting public opinion polls, uh, and really interested in finding out what does the public really think about this particular issue. I mean, uh, you know, in in my role at the survey center, uh, I have had an, a number of groups that have contacted us at various points in time saying we want to conduct this kind of a survey and we kind of want it to come out this way um, and so we, we want to make sure we can we can ask the questions the way we want to and my response is no <laughs> we won't be doing that one of the things that we require in the survey center is that we control all the methodology 
we control the uh, phrasing of the questions. We control where those questions are located within the survey because there can be order effects uh, to questions as well. So uh, any contract that we engage in, uh, we make sure that we control the methodology. The, uh, that, that's interesting, uh, and, and I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. First one is, what poll or survey are you the most proud of in, in your career? Which one were you just, you were there and everybody else was not there? Uh, probably the 1986 uh, governor's race in Wisconsin. Uh, and in that particular race, uh, we were the only polling organization that uh, said uh, Tommy Thompson is leading. Uh, he was kind of within the margin of error, but we were the only ones that indicated that he was leading uh, and could possibly win, and he, he did. There's a second one, actually, that I might be even more proud of, and that is the uh, 2000 presidential election. Uh, the, the Harris poll had George Bush ahead uh, by about uh, 10 points on Monday. We released our poll on Wednesday, and both organizations had been in the field at about the same time. And we had Gore ahead by about uh, 7 or 8 points. And um, we, we had a contact from ABC News. I, uh, they called and said, well, we're trying to figure out whose numbers to use. And so they went through and asked me a whole series of methodological questions. Uh, and then they asked the Harris people those questions. And they called back and asked me a couple more. And, and so I, I said, well, let me, you know, I want to know what, what your conclusion is. And so they called uh, you know, a little while later and said, we're going with you guys. And we're going with your numbers because your methodology was much more stringent than the Harris methodology. Wow. So it's kind of like we went up against one of the big guys in the polling industry, uh, one of the major polling organizations, and uh, we're, uh, we're found that our methods were stronger. So I, I'm very proud of that. You're watching Conversations from St. Norbert College. Joining us today is Dave Weggie, uh, Professor of Political Science at St. Norbert and Director of the Survey Center, which is going through some key changes. And let, let's talk a little bit about, uh, uh, about those changes. You've been mm -hmm. doing something the same way since roughly you know, 1980 or so. Uh, why change a good thing? Well, a couple of reasons. One is, is that, uh, well, the survey world is changing. And so we have to make some changes in relation to the survey world. Our, uh, most of our survey work up to this point in time has been telephone survey work. And so uh, we know that uh, there's a couple of things going on in the, in the telephone survey world that are making surveys more challenging. One is response rates are, are declining. So people are not responding to phone surveys at the same level that they were at an earlier time. And a lot of that falls to uh, uh, things like telemarketing issues and no-call lists. Although researchers are not subject to no-call lists, uh, I think the consumers kind of puts uh, researchers in the, in the same category as telemarketers, and so they don't like to be uh, called a lot. So we have, we have de declining response rates. And so we're shifting the survey piece, we're shifting more to online uh, surveys and probably a bit more to, to mail surveys. So in the survey world, that's happening. Um, but also, uh, as I've uh, you know returned to the survey center, uh, one of the things that I that I uh, think is really important is we at St. Norbert College are sitting on a tremendous amount of intellectual capital. Uh, we have uh, a, a many highly trained faculty members, and their training could be uh, very beneficial not just to the survey center, but in the work we do for communities and, and organizations. And so I would like to, to see us broaden the kinds of services that we're offering, uh, expand the number of faculty that we have involved in uh, some of the research projects that we're engaged in, and as well as getting uh, students uh, actively engaged in this research as well. So the, uh, it's gonna have a new name, yes, right? And it will be called? <coughs> Uh, St. Norbert College Strategic Research Institute. So surveys will be a part of it, but you're going to be doing some other stuff. Right. Uh, now, we had had a conversation some time ago where you had uh, told me that one of the things that really impressed you about this area and Wisconsin in general was the entrepreneurial mm -hmm. uh, element here that seems to be unique here. And these are the folks that you're going to be talking to, is that right, for a lot of this? Well, uh, there are a lot of entrepreneurs in the area that, that uh, need information. I mean, any organization that's going to make an important decision, 
uh, is going to want to have as much information as possible to make the right strategic decision. Uh, we think we can offer some services to help uh, entrepreneurs as well as other organizations, nonprofit organizations, governmental organizations, provide them with the information to, to enhance the, the decision, the strategic decision that they have to make. Uh, so a, a lot of groups that we are, are working with are, uh, you know, in the process of, of making those types of decisions and they look to us to help them find the kinds of information they, they need. Well, one of the things I know as an economist, one of the things that has happened in the last 30 years <coughs> is information in general has become more valuable. You know, we're in a global marketplace, mm -hmm. and I mean, even the guy who's running this tiny little manufacturing business is competing against manufacturers not only across Wisconsin and the U.S., but all over the world. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it's not a very forgiving environment in which to make decisions. No. Uh, and, uh, you know, this kind of stuff is very expensive, or has been very expensive. Mm -hmm. You know, you gotta hire, you know, some giant consulting company and pay them hundreds of thousands of dollars for a simple answer, but that's that's not where you're going, right? No, I, you know, and I, I think that, um, I think in, in this particular market, uh, we have a lot of very successful business people. Uh, and I think a lot of their success has been based upon kind of um, kind of gut intuition of, of what needed to be done. And I think you're right. Uh, that was fine as long as they were kind of uh, maybe in this smaller market, but as, as the markets have expanded nationally and globally, uh, now they're, they're competing against uh, large companies that have all these, these resources. And so maybe making decisions based upon their, their gut intuition is not the best thing to be doing. Uh, and I think you know, one, of, one of our goals uh, as part of our mission is we want to uh, help the community thrive. Uh, we want to enhance economic development uh, in this region. And we think we can provide some important services even for small businesses uh, that will help them make those uh, strategic decisions. And, and it isn't just businesses, but you know, nonprofits are, are feeling the uh, uh, economic downturn and, and how can they best uh, utilize their money. Uh, governments are in the same position. We're doing a lot of work right now with the Green Bay Transit uh, Commission, for example, uh, helping them identify some, some directions uh, for, for the future because uh, finances are going to be uh, a struggle in, in the future for those organizations. So when you look ahead, say, 10 years from now, what do you, I mean, how, what do you see happening? With, with the SRI? What do you see, what, what, uh, well, what, where do you want it to be? Where, where do I want it to be? I would like to see it be a, uh, a, a hub of uh, knowledge and uh, information that when, when uh, local leaders uh, think about uh, needing information uh, and, and knowledge that they, they think about the Strategic Research Institute and I would want to see uh, as part of that, several of our faculty uh, engaged in that uh, institute and several of our students. I mean, this provides a real opportunity for students uh, to have some, uh, do some work that is, uh, you know, real. Needs, need real work <laughs> instead of just theoretical work uh, and will give them a lot of great experience. So uh, I would like to see it be a, a buzzing hive of activity. Yes. <laughs> well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed our show. Uh, Dave, thank you very much for being with us. And until next time, I'm Kevin Quinn. Best wishes for good conversations from St. Norbert College. For more information about the St. Norbert College Strategic Research Institute, Contact Director David Wege at 920-403-3960.